very good morning to all of you. Abundant thanks to uh, Dr. Vitul Gupta sir for giving me an opportunity to be able to be present over here amongst all of you. To all the august gathering of very senior physicians who are present here, who have uh, invested years of their life in learning medicine, cardiology, and all the other aspects. I would like to today talk about a topic which is very dear to my heart. Cardio obstetrics, the road ahead. Well, the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. We all know how imperative it is to save a mother's life because it's not just saving a mother, but a mother and a child duo. So if you look at the data which WHO had, around 28% of the deaths were caused because of pre-existing medical conditions which were exacerbated by pregnancy like diabetes and obesity and so on. The direct causes because of the pregnancy because of which women were dying like blood clots, abortion complications, obstetric causes have relatively come down. There is a rise in pregnancy induced high blood pressure. So there is a change in the scenario and what's happening in our country. So this is India and this is the maternal mortality ratio. And we can see how across the years the maternal mortality ratio has come down and we need to look at a target in 2030 where we'll be having even a maternal a mortality ratio, an MMR of less than 100, somewhere around 70 is our target. Having said that, let us see that what is happening to maternal deaths. World over the maternal deaths have come down. The maternal deaths have also come down in India. However, 12% of all the mothers who die world over, they are from our country. Also, India stands somewhere second in the world when we talk of the mothers who are dying during pregnancy. And what is the cause of the death? Well, if we look at the countries which are developed as in UK or in the United States, cardiac disease is the number one killer of the mothers. Cardiovascular ailments, have risen and that is what is leading us to what we call as obstetric transition. So what is this obstetric transition? In underdeveloped countries like in African countries like in India, India is now well somewhere in developing nations but many many years ago it was the direct causes because of pregnancy like uh, direct obstetric causes, infections, sepsis, peripheral hemorrhages which were causing maternal mortality. However, as the advancement occurs, cardiovascular causes took a lead. In developed country, it's lower maternal mortality due to direct causes. More of maternal mortality is due to indirect causes in which cardiovascular causes take a predominance. And that is where we as India are somewhere between developing to developed nation are. We are in a stage of obstetric transition. That means we are now going towards a stage where the maternal deaths are no longer occurring primarily due to direct obstetric causes. The maternal deaths which are very much preventable are now attributed to underlying cardiovascular causes. Having said that, why is this happening? Let us see. Well, more and more cardiovascular diseases are now detected when a girl child is there in utero. School health schemes are there. More of these girl children get treated and they survive to an age where they can get pregnant. So, women with congenital heart diseases, valvular heart diseases are living and surviving to reach an age when they are getting pregnant. There are advancements in diagnosis and management. Women are getting pregnant at later ages, hence having more conditions like gestational diabetes, pregnancy-induced hypertension, maternal placental syndromes, and so on. And of course, our adverse lifestyle habits and cardiovascular risk factors, women are out into the world, they are bearing the risks and all the possible things that the society has to offer as they walk out into the world. The direct obstetric causes of maternal death like bleeding, infection and sepsis are now well taken care of. Having said that, 
This was a very recent publication in European Heart Journal by Justin Paul et al., in which they studied more than 1,000 women and they found that adverse maternal predictors were left ventricular dysfunction, prosthetic heart valve, pulmonary hypertension, significant mitral stenosis, and current pregnancy diagnosis. Uh, maternal cardiac events were very significant in presence of left ventricular dysfunction followed by the presence of a prosthetic heart valve. So what were the key findings of this MPAC registry from Madras Medical College? Well, it said that first diagnosis of heart disease was most of the times made during pregnancy in around 60% of the cases. Rheumatic heart disease was common in 42%. Congenital heart disease was seen in around 33%. There was high maternal morbidity and mortality. Heart failure was seen in around 10% of the patients and high maternal risk predictors, as I previously also mentioned, were low ejection fraction, pulmonary hypertension, prosthetic valve, current pregnancy uh, diagnosis of a heart disease and the take home message, well, for low and middle income countries, it was that we need a cardio obstetric scheme approach. We need an early diagnosis of a cardiac ailment. We need preconception counseling. We need offering a lesion specific counseling. The counseling for presence of severe mitral stenosis cannot be the same as that of mitral regurgitation. We all know that severe mitral stenosis behaves the worst being an obstructed lesion. A regurgitant lesion in pregnancy is very well tolerated. So we need that kind of counseling for our patients which has to be lesion specific. We need to develop customized risk scores for our very population and the guidelines. So we need a cardio obstetrics team where we have a combination of an obstetrician, a cardiologist and in fact a maternal fetal medicine specialist. In countries abroad, maternal fetal medicine is a three-year fellowship program in fact which can be taken up by obstetricians and people in medicine. So we need that, we need geneticists, we need anesthesiologists, neonatologists, pharmacists, nurses all together to come and start working even in the pre-pregnancy time where counseling has to be given, medication review has to be done, there has to be a counseling of contraception as well and when all pregnancy should be taken and feasible. Monitoring during pregnancy, very important, medication review, blood pressure monitoring, disease specific monitoring and then the very much planning of the delivery. We all know that the second phase of the labor is very stressful for the mother and we need to cut down that short, uh, that second stage of labor so many times. So the decision of vaginal delivery versus a cesarean section in a patient who has an underlying cardiac lesion and might be prone to going into pulmonary edema is very, very imperative. We also need to have a decision of spontaneous versus an induced delivery. We need to have peripartum cardiac monitoring. To emphasize enough, now we have four trimesters in pregnancy. It's not just three. First trimester, second trimester, third trimester and the fourth trimester begins when the mother delivers and the 12 weeks following the delivery constitutes the fourth trimester of the pregnancy, the postpartum period, which is very, very important because most of the cardiac events are believed to occur in the fourth trimester of pregnancy. And once the woman has delivered in the postpartum phase, we need to monitor the patient, advise contraception and have risk factor modification. So this is what the view was in one of the studies published in JAK. So in states they found that cardiomyopathy constituted around 23% and arrhythmia was seen in 30% of the pregnant women and 16% of them had valvular heart diseases, around 24% had congenital. So around 20 to 25% of the proportion was taken up by arrhythmias, cardiomyopathy and congenital diseases and valvular were less but we know that in a country like us where we have rheumatic heart disease and other diseases we thought why not have a look at our data. So this is the data from my institute at Dayanand Medical and College and Hospital where we have looked over the data of the patients who were admitted in our setup in the last 10 years. 
So this is how the women were distributed. Most of them presented between 26 to 30 years of age. In fact, a significant proportion of more than 15% was also contributed by the elderly women who were more than 36. The maximum number, the 75% of them presented with peripartum cardiomyopathy. However, sepsis was also an important constituent in around 11 to 12% of the patients, followed by all the other causes. Valvular heart disease, again, it was found in around 11 to 12% of patients, which was lesser as compared to the study that we had from South. And severe mitral stenosis was a significant cause of the presentation and stuck prosthetic mitral valves were seen in complicated pre uh, pregnancies who came and got admitted in the emergency of our institute. Arrhythmias were also seen again in around 11 to 12 percent of the patients, most commonly supraventricular tachycardias, ventricular tachycardia and flutter were also noticed. And if we looked at the age-based presentation, we found that a significant value was attached in the younger age groups, less than 25, they were most commonly admitted with sepsis and ATI. However, deep vein thrombosis in 26 to 30 years of age and in 31 to 35 years, this is the time when BIH, eclampsia and preeclampsia took over. BMV was done in one of the patients, uterine embolizations had to be performed in three. Uh, patients with arrhythmia needed DC cardioversion and RFA. But the most important finding which we realized was that out of 120 patients whom we recorded, around 107 of them actually were admitted to us after a cesarean section. They were sent to us after an LSCS. This is the time when a cardiologist received the patient from the gynecologist, the obstetricians or other centers to stabilize the patient. None of these patients actually underwent a vaginal delivery which was so very stunning and uh, uh, not acceptable. Uh, having said that, we also found that around 20% of these patients had to be ventilated and we looked at the data, patients of cardiomyopathy, patients of PIH, and patients who went into ATI and needed renal replacement therapy, these were the patients who needed the ventilation with an attached significant value. So we thought and probably concluded that pregnant patients with cardiovascular ailments were referred very late to us, usually post LSCS, and one third of them needed ventilatory support. A timely referral to a cardio-obstetric team could probably help us mitigate these adverse maternal-fetal outcomes and encourage a favorable protocol-based approach. So what should be the triggers to refer a patient in time to a cardio-obstetrics program? Well, in a patient with known cardiovascular disease, a preconception counseling should become imperative. And once we know that this patient is in a stage when she's going to plan to conceive, she should be referred to the cardio-obstetric team. In a patient who already has a cardiovascular disease or is having a pregnancy where there's a possibility of developing a cardiovascular disease, again, performance of investigations as echocardiograms, anti-pro-BNPs can help a primary care provider or an obstetrician or even a cardiologist or a physician to decide that I need to send this patient to a cardio-obstetrics program. So a cardio-obstetrics program, I've already mentioned, it's, it's a list which contains so many specialities put together. It's not just the physicians, a cardiologist, an obstetrician. I talked about maternal fetal medicine, which is a fellowship program in itself in states now. Anesthetists, neonatologists, nursing, pharmacists, social workers, and all of them work in this circle. They start from counseling, decision making, monitoring, immediate postpartum care, and then an outpatient follow up for long term risk assessment and management. But not to forget is an advanced specialty care in the form of heart failure, pulmonary hypertension specialist, asynotic congenital or cyanotic congenital heart disease specialist, interventional cardiologist, and of course, cardiac surgery. As I mentioned, I can see a cardiac surgeon walk across the room also there. And yes, 
We need to understand that when we talk of these patients, we have to segregate them into three parts. One is patients who already have a disorder of heart and vascular system. And second is the patients who develop an adverse pregnancy outcome. So already who have a heart or a vascular problem, those who are having an underlying congenital heart disease, pulmonary hypertension, valvular heart disease, cardiomyopathies, they are already prone. We need to send them to a cardio-obstetric team and manage them. Then there are patients who develop adverse outcomes during pregnancy. Pregnancy-induced hypertension, adverse maternal placental syndromes, gestational diabetes, preterm delivery, and nowadays gestational dyslipidemia in itself is also associated with eclampsia, preeclampsia, and adverse pregnancy outcomes, but much more than them. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand that pregnancy in a woman's life is a stress test. We know that if a patient comes to us and is breathless, we say go and get a TMT done. We say go and get a stress eco done. There has been enough data which has been published. In fact, a full supplement of circulation was dedicated as a red heart signal for women where it was mentioned that pregnancy is a stress test in a woman's life. If a woman develops PIH, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, maternal placental syndrome, stillbirths and so on during pregnancy, this is a harbinger of a future cardiovascular event in her life and this is the lady whom you need to follow up very, very regularly and guide her. And this is what is shown right in the center of this cartoon diagram. The risk factors which a woman develops will take her towards adverse CV outcomes. So, we need to work very hard. We need to understand that cardiovascular care needs so many imperative managements. For instance, ischemic heart disease, management of antiplatelet therapy um, in pregnancy, cardiomyopathy, anticoagulation in peripartum cardiomyopathy, arrhythmias, refractory arrhythmias, which drugs to give, need of ablation. It's not simple when it has to be done for a pregnant patient. We understand taking that patient in a flow and doing these procedures can be so involving so many management decisions and a heart team at best can give the best to the patient. And similarly for hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, we know so many drugs are contraindicated, so many can be administered and it's so many issues which are involved. For instance, if we have to give hydralazine, we know reflex tachycardia, how it affects the fetus, which drug can be given, beta blockers cannot be administered, libetalol is safe. And, and now we have, in fact, a list of drugs which are no longer categorized as schedule X drugs and so on. In fact, the latest guidelines tell us not to look at class A, B and C drugs and X drugs. They tell us to look and individualize a patient and then treat the patient. So similarly, anticoagulants in pregnancy, there is so much in pregnancy to be looked which needs a team-based approach. And we need, it is important that to understand it's not just pregnancy, it's the fourth trimester of pregnancy. Post-delivery follow-up is very, very important. Why? For three things. Number one, at the bottom, the postpartum monitoring. As I said, fourth trimester, the most important time to have CV events. This is the time when we need to titrate the cardiac medicines. This is the time when we need to control the blood pressure properly. We need to look at aortic dissect, uh, dimensions in a patient who has got an underlying aortic disease. We need to reevaluate the LV functions. We need to reevaluate the valvular functions because we understand that in pregnancy cardiac output changes are so dynamic that all these readings could have been having an early. After that, we need to take care of the contraception. We need to see whether we need to give progesterone-only contraception or we need to add estrogen because we understand that these therapies have their own thrombotic implications and we are well aware of the thromboembolic complications which can arise due to contraception. We need to look at the patient preference, the individualization, where the patient lives from, where the patient is coming, is the patient ready or not. And of course, as I said that pregnancy is a stress test, the future cardiovascular disease risk has to be understood and it has to be addressed. How? In the form of weight loss, physical activity, cholesterol monitoring, blood pressure monitoring. And so, you know, the woman gets pregnant, has a baby and forgets. Forgets for damn 20 years. And by that time, before she realizes she's already had a cardiac event. So this is 
Our study from our center where we studied about the cardiac health awareness in the women who are coming for a routine health checkup. So, and what we realized was that just 30% of women came to us and over the last 10 or 15 years, the trends in presentation of women for cardiac checkup, check we can see in this diagram, have remained just from 22 to 28% with very subtle improvement. And this thing stood true across all the uh, stages of uh, menstrual uh, cycle or reproductive life of a woman. Pre-menopausal women were the least who presented. But pregnancy and reproductive life is imperative. We need to understand the cardiovascular risk at this time and we need to have a better female attendance, the cardioobstetric model of care which can help us in management of a patient right from preconception, the risk adjustment, utilization of scales like WHO scale, Capric 2 scale, Zahara scale. Then look at the woman who gets pregnant, delivers in the modality which has been chosen for her depending upon her cardiac lesion and then of course planning for her anesthesia we understand that cardiovascular ailments are not simple planning of anesthesia spinal ga mode of delivery vaginal assisted second phase the second phase is most important when the placenta contracts and sends all the all the blood right into the circulation which is already overlaid, the patient has maximum possibility of going into pulmonary edema at that time. Then the postpartum phase, very important, look for features of embolism, look for features of uh, uncontrolled hypertension, manage these patients and then the fourth trimester begins, which I have already emphasized enough and then the long term follow up of CVT risk monitoring. So ladies and gentlemen, a stepwise approach in understanding the disease spectrum, developing a pregnancy heart team, and then going over to improving research and registry data, and then improving training and education. The road ahead is long. We need multiple team members. We need to improve our work with a multidisciplinary team, research, have stakeholders, and now with social media, we need to publicize it enough and have a curriculum and development training because it is very important that cardio-obstetric research is carried on and delivery of patient care is given right at the doorstep. So this is how the road can be ahead. Cardio-obstetric emerges as a field. We talk of the field, we become aware of this field. Then we optimize the care and we deliver it. Then we bring it into real world practice, in clinical practice. When we are all together in managing a patient who has a cardiac ailment, this would definitely lead to significant improvement in cardio-obstetric care and help us do away with cardiovascular cause, which is a preventable cause of preventing a mortality or morbidity in a pregnant patient. The challenges, of course, are there. We need more research on that. However, if we take everyone together, the challenges will be addressed and this would shape the future of cardio-obstetrics in our country. So it's a mission, it's a scope, has a scope and the road ahead. In words of Napoleon Hill, strength and growth come not only through continuous effort and struggle. The untiring efforts of initiating a cardio-obstetrics team network across the country could be a promising step to safe and maternal and fruitful neonatal outcomes. We just need to begin. We are all aware of these lines. We have all read our Harrison and we know no greater opportunity, responsibility or obligation can fall to a lot of human being than being a physician. I would be able to say that when this physician treats a pregnant woman this responsibility, this opportunity, and this obligation is not just doubled, it is multiple times. We all need to customize ourselves to this thought and work on it. Thank you very much.